Good morning. I have a question. Um, one of the special things about D.C. is that there's such a healthy and big and thriving middle class. And it seems that this history, first movers advantage, has created this, that we don't have this disparity where either all the African Americans are um, a part of the elite or, you know, part of the welfare system. Can other states, other cities that don't have this first movers advantage catch up and create a better, stronger middle class instead of having this, this big gap between the black community? Well, um, you know, every time I was born in Newland, Georgia, I went to college in Atlanta. I said this earlier. And every time I, uh, every time I say that the Washington, D.C. has the largest black middle class uh, in the country, somebody from Atlanta challenges me on that. Uh, because they do have a very large middle, black middle class there in Atlanta. And some people say it's surpassed Washington, uh, D.C. Not only, uh, even if you include Prince George's County, as a part of as Ward Nine, as part of the city, they got the same thing going on down there with the Cato, Georgia, and those sections. I live. I was born south of Atlanta, so all the poor people live moved down to my section of town. The middle class blacks moved north down there, but but Atlanta is, a, is an area that has a, a, a tremendous uh, uh, support. There's also five historically black colleges there. What made Washington D.C. special was Howard University. Howard University was a large black college in the United States over, uh, with over 12,000 students now. They've had uh, graduate schools of law and architecture and, and medicine since the 1900s. And uh, as blacks come here to go to school, they couldn't go back and practice law in Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama. So they would stay here uh, because it's the nation's capital, all the special things that Bernard talked about. And also the way segregation worked, they had to live in these black neighborhoods. So the neighborhoods were more diverse because people had to live in those neighborhoods. And they lived there until the Fire, Fair Housing Act allowed them to move north of Walter Reed for the first time, and then out to the suburbs for the first time. So, so uh, <clears throat> but I think that tells you something about the special peculiarity of Washington and the role of these colleges and universities. And, and it's particularly interesting that there are no, in the major cities of the country, in New York and Chicago and those places, there are no historically black colleges. So, you, so we don't even talk about them in the same breath because, this, because of the absence of, of, of education, which is a key driving factor. Uh, that is a really good question that you asked. And I think, I think part of it has to do with the critical mass of people. Now what's happening in all great urban centers is that there is a critical mass of African Americans that they can really promote um, their own business opportunities, their own political opportunities, number one. Number two, you do need those that university base. That university base attracts these young, young students who then, uh, unfortunately, perhaps, don't go back to Mississippi or don't go back to Oklahoma. They stay where that critical mass is, and they build businesses, they build law professions, they build, et cetera. And then you may need that political leadership. That political leadership has to be it, and that's part of what the, the power of the vote is all about. Marion Barry was politically sensitive. Marion Barry changed the nature of this, this city from a southern sleepy town to a major metropolitan area because when he unleashed his understanding of black power, it completely changed Washington, D.C. So all of these things are happening at the same time. That was a very good question. Yeah, I'd like to add something to this. I mean, I think, I think there's a challenge Because, you know, during, during segregation, there really was a, you know, a vibrant economy within the African American community. And in, in many cases, things like urban renewal you know, trampled over it. I do think that there is a recognition among, uh, you know, national leaders as well as local leaders that, that this is that this is a problem. And, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, primarily of like, you know, the magazine Black Enterprise. I mean, that is, you know, Earl Graves, the publisher of that, was you know, extremely conscious of the fact that, first of all, African Americans weren't uh, recognized for their their business contributions, but he also was very, you know, interested in finding ways to promote African in business, finding ways to get African Americans on the board of directors. Uh, I think this is, but I do think your question actually is, you know, an extremely good one. And obviously, I'm not, you know, I'm not satisfied. We've answered it up here, but it is, it is a question that really should be, you know, looked at by 
you know, really anybody interested in this problem. Good morning. Um, I'm a native Washingtonian. In fact, my mother was born in 1940 uh, at 2727 End Street, uh, which is known now as Georgetown. Um, I would like to know if any of the panelists could speak to the transition of communities. I grew up east of the river um, in Ward 8. Um, but at, there was a time when the diversity of the city was such where my grandparents could live in Georgetown from 1939 to 1941. Can you speak to the transition of communities in the district? Well, that, that's one of the things that I thought someone might mention with regards to the, that segment of the population that seemed to move from Georgetown to Foggy Bottom to Southwest to, uh, to Southeast. Uh, and as this urban renewal took place, that's kind of how these communities moved and now from southeast to the extension of the district, which we call Ward 9. <laughs> um, so um, I, I know that this, this sort of migration took place. I don't know. I mean, I could, I'm not the historian, so I can't give all the uh, um, background on how or why it happened other than um, I don't know. Did your mother own her home in, in Georgetown? No, my, my grandparents did not own it. Okay. So in a, in, a, in a panel that I participated on not too long ago, we talked a lot about this, you know, word that has been floating around, gentrification. And that seems to have been, uh, is the impetus between uh, or why communities get moved because they are not owners. And when owners decide to come back and reclaim because of, you know, this, this urban renewal or whatever it, they call it, people get pushed. And that's what happened. They just, uh, our communities got pushed. Um, they get pushed away or pushed out. Could I just, could I just respond to that? Uh, and I want to respond in two ways. One, uh, when I talk about the great expansion of income in the African American community, we go from $8 billion to $19 billion. Uh, uh, $900 billion. Uh, most of that income uh, is, uh, relates to the election of black mayors. Uh, it's money that's earned in the public sector. Uh, by the time we get to 2008, there's 19 million blacks registered to vote. There's 405 black mayors in the United States. The mayor of every major city in the country is African American. Uh, the employment of what happens in D.C. is we go from a sleepy southern town with 20,000 employees to almost 50,000 employees. Those sleepy southern 20,000 employees are mostly white. When Barry takes over and we help him, I'm a council member here by then, uh, those now you see African Americans come, not only just coming into the government, now coming in at top level jobs. Uh, that, I wanted to say that. Secondly, the <coughs> that figure I told you about, the $900 billion figure, I got it from, from the, um, from the, uh, uh, from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. There's also a number in there that says how much racial discrimination had depressed that number. That, if that number would have been much higher if there had not been discrimination in Florida. Okay, so, so that's, uh, and I think that's, that's an important uh, consideration too. Uh, but finally, uh, as I said before, if these jobs are tied up with these uh, black mayors being in office, and gentrification is going to flip the population to the point where maybe these African Americans can't get elected mayor, uh, I think that that means for going down the road, uh, we are going to have to do like President Obama, learn how to negotiate more with like-minded whites. Most of these whites who move back to these cities are liberal white people. They're not rednecks from South Carolina and Georgia and Alabama. Uh, they're good people who are fair-minded, hard-working people, and they'll work with us, and we have to learn to work with them. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Before, before I forget, Can before I forget, uh, every third Saturday in July at Francis Middle School in Foggy Bottom, there is the Georgetown Foggy Bottom Black Family Reunion starting at noon. And it's a big picnic on the grounds. You're more than welcome. Come bring your barbecue, your, your, your grill, your, 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 they have music. But every third Thursday in July, Georgetown Foggy Bottom Black Family Reunion. Be there or be square. <laughs> <laughs> 
relation to the transformation of Georgetown? You know, I, I think when, in, in, you know, in the post-war period, uh, there, there, is, there is a sentiment that one of the ways we can begin to develop the city and community is to promote the historic nature of, you know, certain cities. You know, Georgetown was first, you know, Capitol Hill, it, that, it, you know, it took, took some route later. So, and also at the same time, there, there's, there's white flight in other areas of the city. So, Georgetown is, Georgetown is kind of, an, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very different case where the African American population is essentially displaced to move to, to, another, to another place. And often they, they kept their same institutions in Georgetown. Some of their churches are still black churches in Georgetown. That persists today. But it's, the, the, the dynamics of this are extremely complicated. And uh, I'm not the person to, to answer your question, but it's, it's, it's something that um, I think all of us should be exploring. If you'd like to talk afterwards, I can give you more. Um, before, uh, between 1870 and 1970, Foggy Bottom was majority black. Um, Charles Drew was from Foggy Bottom, Ray from Logan, Petey Green, uh, uh, Colby King, go on and on and on. But when they became middle class and professional class, they did in fact leave. They left because they could leave. They could leave in the 1950s and 60s, and they bought homes, and they went elsewhere, and they bought bigger and better homes in the north part of the city in Prince George's County. Um, but yes, in, in Foggy Bottom, way down by where the Watergate is now, and by where, where, the, um, where the highway um, spaghetti is now, that was, in fact, a black slums there. In the 1940s and 50s, 30s, 40s and 50s, the federal government began to do urban renewal, which Congressman Walter Conkroy used to call Negro removal, not urban renewal. And that was, they in fact did move those people out of the slums and uh, put them into other places like the Southwest. And then eventually, with white flight, they go to Anacostia. Um, we are way beyond our time. We're going to take two more, there are two more questions. And uh, I'm, I'm enjoying this, though. I hope you all are, too. So. Good morning. I'm Kenneth Ward with College Bound, and thank you, PNC, for putting this together because I think this dialogue is really great. Um, I taught history here in D.C. for 15 years, so a lot of what you're talking about I know. Um, what I'm, I guess, perplexed with, though, is when we look at the current data, and some of that data just came out two weeks ago. They talked about test scores between black kids and white kids in the city. There's this huge discrepancy. We look at graduation rates. The graduation rate, depending upon who you look at, is always below 60%. Um, there's this huge uh, incarceration um, of our youth. And how do we leverage this great history? Because we talk about first in freedom, first in leadership. How do we be leaders in this city to really turn around what's happening with our youth? I run a college access program. Right now, we need 10 mentors. We're knocking on doors. I'm calling up fraternity brothers, Kappas, um, trying to get them to mentor. Um, and it's really hard getting people out with our students. And these are kids who have the ability to go to college but they don't have someone who's willing to take two hours to work with them. So we talk about Mary Church Terrell, Robert Smalls, talk about great sacrifices. I think this new sacrifice needs to be the small things that we are not doing that we will certainly pay for later because PNC needs great people to work for them. So if we really don't invest in the lives of these youth, where do we get those folks from? And I think we're missing a great opportunity. So how do we leverage this so when people leave today, they're not necessarily giving back to College Bound, but to some organization to really make an impact in the lives of the next generation. We don't need to answer that. <laughs> you, you, you answered it. Yeah, I think you did. You answered it with your frat brothers and with everybody else helping you out. And please, you know, you know, uh, talk to me about GW. If we can, and Howard, kids are right there. You know, I mean, you're right. It's the mentorship um, concept, and your question is rhetorical, and it's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, my name is Pierpont Mobley. I'm a Washingtonian. I was born here. Uh, I have a strange question, probably to answer the question that was just presented earlier. And I think the major uh, talk about gentrification. Uh, I'm old enough to have been one who uh, actually worked in the White House 16 years, wrote the first affirmative action plan for the White House, okay? So I'm very proud of myself and proud of my family. We all live here in D.C. Very proud of my brother, Frank Smith. Who married my cousin? So you know we got a connection. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we have a connection, right? Uh, I think, uh, and to amplify what was just said about, also about the fact that uh, 
uh, why we don't have enough folks to want to spend some time to give something back. I think that's the other issue. But to connect with uh, the person who made the statement in terms of why there's a big disparity, one of the biggest issues is economics. See, what has happened in D.C. since I was born here, raised here, went to school here, went to law school here, biggest dilemma is the fact that uh, our old folks can't afford to stay here. They just cannot stay here. Uh, can you imagine living where I lived at 13th and H Northeast, and you buy a place over there with Atlas Theater, I don't know if you're not familiar with it, but buy a place over there and cost you $500,000, okay? I, my, my folks bought a house over there for $42,000. Fabulous place, and when she, uh, my parents passed, uh, we sold the house for 150. Now it's worth, I hate to tell you, it's a, a detached house, and it's probably worth about a million dollars on 13th Street. So if anyone wanted to understand why the dynamics are like they are, it reminds me of something that I read long ago. It must, must be about, uh, about 60 years ago. In D.C., uh, Bernard was talking about all these renaissance, and I'm familiar with that. I went to Howard, actually I sang at Howard Theater. But the bottom line is, what has happened today is that we just did not influence our folks to, to save their money. I'm being very honest, to make sure that when their parents passed, uh, they could retain, keep the house. And so a lot of the young people uh, are selling their houses because the money is it. <laughs> Somebody come in and say, I'm going to buy your house for $400,000. That's where it is. So that's what has happened. And rest assured, I was just up Billy Simpson's place on George Avenue last week. And I tell you, if you go inside that building, you say, what in the world happened? Things have changed. And the folks that are coming in, that word of mouth, they're coming in from Wichita, Kansas, with money, uh, inheritance money, and they can afford to rent. Uh, Twenty-nine hundred dollars a month. Folks that live here can't do it. So God bless everyone. Okay. While you're clapping, let's uh, let's if you don't mind. Frank Smith is about to leave. Dr. Smith, let's give him a round of applause. Dr. Bernard Demchek. Dr. Mary Beth Corrigan. Um, let's give your colleague, uh, Kim Alexander, a round of applause, I think, for putting together. She's probably, I know she's, uh, I know she's lost sleep and she's probably lost weight and everything else because she's been working on this for quite some time and it's been a pleasure to, to work with her. Um, I just want to say to you all, thank you all so much for coming. There was something I was going to say, but you know, I, I got, I'm at that point where I can't remember. So, um... Um, but PNC, you all are on the ball, and I think it's just a wonderful thing that you've, you, you know from this conversation the responsibility that you carry in your jobs to um, maintain the history and to, um, you, you know, it's, it's a burden now that you have uh, when you talk about a community that you pay a, a, lot, a large part in trying to, um, you know, keep a healthy, wealthy community. So, um, Mike? Come on up. I think you're going to close out. Oh, that was the last thing. There's you could. I just want to say also to the Historical Society, thank God they're still here. Thank God they'll stay strong. Let's support the Historical Society. And just, you know, it's, this is the institution that will, again, protect that history, and we want to support them. They didn't talk about memberships, but yes, you can become a member of the Historical Society, so hopefully they have something for you to sign up. I've got to renew my membership as well. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thanks to the panel. Thank to all of, thanks to all of you. This is, uh, it's always better than I anticipate every year. And it's because we have really vibrant questions. I'm still thinking about that middle class question. That's a, that's a world class question about we need to figure out how to do that. We at the bank have a responsibility to make sure that this community is developed evenly and fairly, not just optimally. That's the easy part. Uh, housing is a real problem here, a real problem. And we were at a, uh, with several of us, we were at a groundbreaking for some affordable housing the other day. And I'm delighted to see the mayor put some incremental dollars into affordable housing. 
you know, one of the things we do not have that other cities have done to try to protect that, we do not have widespread rent control. But one of the things we need to have is affordable housing. It's immoral for the people that work for us to have to come 35 miles to work because they can't afford to live here. Something's wrong. And so we and everybody in the financial community and the city has to make sure that we build affordable housing. And affordable housing here is not $175,000. That's not affordable. That may be cheaper than most everything else, but it's not affordable. It's the number one thing we have to work on. So we invite all of you uh, to participate in that and give us the ideas of how to do that and talk to your council members about that because sometimes they're late to the party in terms of understanding that a ribbon cutting for affordable housing may not be a crowd gatherer, but it's a big deal. So thank you so much for being here.